What's happening YouTubes? Vector here, back again. We're out on another little ride. Slightly different one today though. We're heading back to the uh, Roach, that's how I know it's pronounced. The uh, Roach Rock in Roach, funnily enough. Which is, uh, it's an ancient chapel to St. Michael, I think it was. And it's on top of a, uh, a 20 meter granite lump of rock. Like, it's, it's an incredible bit of engineering, really, in architecture. Loads of history there. I've been there before, I made a video going there for, for the first time, link above. But the reason for the trip today is, um, it's actually not purely a sightseeing trip. You see, uh, the land that the chapel is on is not owned by the public or not owned by anyone local. It's owned by <laughs> Lord Falmouth. Uh, I think he's the Viscount Falmouth. Uh, he's the 10th Lord Falmouth and he's the 29th largest landowner in England. So he's, he's some rich bell and he lives in Kent. So literally the other side of the country from us. And, uh, hello. <laughs> Get on, boys. That was class. <laughs> yeah, uh, what's I saying? Yeah, Falmouth. So, despite being called Lord Falmouth, he has, he has real names, obviously. I think Lord Falmouth is a title. He has a, a by six names, because of course he does. But instead of um, living in Falmouth, or Falmouth area, as per the, his title, he in fact uh, lives in Kent. The reason we're bringing him up is uh, he's recently, I said recently, he's at some point this year, he has removed access to bollocks. Lovely. Um, to the chapel. Are you all? Yeah, he's, uh, you can still get to the land. You can still walk around the bottom of it for now. But um, he's removed the way up. He's, he's blocked off the ladder. And he's just, he's gone, fuck you, so you can't, you can't go up there now. As a result, there is today a meetup. You could call it a protest, you could call it a rally, whatever you want to call it. It's organised by Right to Rome Kerno, uh, the subdivision of Right to Rome. And it's, uh, yeah, just to get people together to talk about rich Belens removing access to things that have been public access for like hundreds and thousands of years. There's going to be some talks about the history of, of both the rock and the chapel but also about this sort of thing happening before because this is not the first time that we've lost access to this uh this chapel let me open this briefly um it's happened several times and actually one of the previous times was a previous lord falmouth uh, it was in uh, let me see if i remember the, the numbers i think it was 1897 the uh, then Lord Falmer fenced off the entire area, not just the uh, the rock itself. Fenced it off completely, put signs up saying, you can't come here, it's just mine now, get out. And uh, the police being, you know, largely just a sort of rich person's militia then, and let's face it now, the uh, he was able to pay the police to have a 24-hour guard. Just a police officer stood uh, guarding the fence. The locals didn't take kindly to that, as you can imagine. So, first they tore down some of the fences, and then there were protests. Uh, and then eventually they uh, they blew up one of his signs with dynamite, which is, is fantastic. <laughs> so, I don't know if we're quite going that far today, but um, yeah, it's going to be interesting. And, you know, this is a very a prudent topic at the moment. There are sort of, there's two main conversations to be had from this, I think. The first involves right to roam in general and you know if you follow the news particularly in the southwest we lost our wild camping on Dartmoor. Dartmoor has a public right to access and it also has uh, an ancient bylaw that gives us right to uh, recreation on the moors. There are some exceptions you're not allowed to hunt you're not allowed to fish things like that but in terms of just accessing having a good time that's uh, always been our right. Now a little while ago now, probably a year or two ago, I think, at this point, one of the landowners of Dartmoor, this um, guy called Alexander Darwell, who is, uh, is a hedge fund manager, he's also a right-wing donator, unsurprisingly, um, he's, he challenged that in court, and he, basically because he doesn't want poor people getting around on his land when he's trying to hunt grouse and stuff. 
So he challenged that right in court and he actually won, which is ridiculous. So we lost the right to wild camp on Dartmoor. Now, wild camping, Dartmoor is the only place in England, and Wales for that matter, which uh, where wild camping is legal. And he took that, even that bucket of, it's like, snippet of, of, of right and freedom away from us. Successfully, at first, there was a huge public outcry from this, of course, and through a variety of protests from, from organisation, from actually crowdfunding, because um, Dartmoor National Park Authority were the people who eventually challenged his challenge, but they don't have any money, they, they've got no budget as it is. They can barely afford the ranges they have, let alone a lengthy legal battle with a very, very rich individual. So we, they were able to crowdfund a bunch of money to challenge that in court, and we were succeeded. And the, the decision was overthrown, and wild camping was reinstated. Everyone wins, and everyone's happy. For about, what, seven, eight months, something like that, I think? No one has now appealed the appeal on the appeal, and it's it's gone up to the highest court in the country, to the Supreme Court. It was in there, he had his hearing the other day, and again, he's trying to argue that the only right that anyone has there is pure access and not anything else. Um, to the point that his uh, his lawyers and himself in court uh, argued that anything other than purely walking or riding a horse would put you as uh, <laughs> illegally occupying the land and trespass. And that includes like stopping, sitting down, enjoying the view, taking photos, stargazing, having a picnic, and of course, wild camping. And he was literally, he was asked by the judge in court, um, so if someone was taking a picnic on Dartmoor, you would deem them to be uh, trespassing and liable to be sued if they refused to like sod off again. And he said, and the lawyers said, yes, absolutely. You know, we've always said like, there's, there's plenty of people for and against wild camping. We've always said from the start, it's not about the wild camping, it's about control. And it's about just removing people. It's about setting a precedent. And now it's out in the open, plain and simple. That, that is exactly what they want. They don't want people to have any access at all to this national park, by the way. Yes, it's some of it is privately owned, some of it is not, but it's just craziness to me. It really is. Well, so that's, that's been through the, the Supreme Court. They are deliberating. There's no time frame on how long that will take. But uh, we'll see what happens with that. To be honest, I'm not all that confident. I mean, I wasn't all that confident last time, I suppose. But I worry that the further up the sort of justice system you get, the more liable it is for uh, <laughs> financial influence, shall we say. And um, also, like, the the less likely that they're going to take the side of the sort of ordinary working class man. Uh, let me get back to you after this conjunction because I hate this place. Right, where was I? Yeah, I just, I feel like, yes, the judges are, are, are supposed to be impartial, that's their job, but let's face it, no one's really impartial. And when you get to the point of being a, a judge on the Supreme Court, the things you probably don't have much in common with for example, me or you or, you know, your average Joe who is affected by this. And you're probably going to have more in common with Mr. Moneybag Starwell and his posse and his people. Um, and also there is, there's a worry because um, the Supreme Court is the highest you can go. Whatever happens, win or lose here, that's it. Okay, but like, you can't appeal the Supreme Court. Like, whatever happens stays happened until such time as like a, like a national government legislation changes it. So, they might, there's a, could be a concern that if they side with us here, it could then set a, uh, a precedent which could be used to grant more rights in other areas, such as other national parks, and then eventually a national right to roam, which is really the goal of all this. Uh, and that's exactly what we want, obviously, but it's not what they want, so... I don't know, we'll, we'll see what happens there. I mean, realistically, will it be policed? Well, 
unfortunately yeah and actually it's going to be policed just like most things are and as we saw during for example uh, the pandemic it will be policed and it will be policed in a biased basis probably against young people people of color we saw during the pandemic pock teenagers were getting unfairly policed and questioned and harassed for being out and um you know were they following the rules were they like out on their one daily walk or whatever but then like sort of <laughs> middle-aged white people tended not to be you know and it would be exactly that again that was an extension to this which is all of this is happening against a backdrop where the public has so little right in this country to go anywhere and do anything you have to remember the public in this country we have access but like a, a public right access to eight percent of the land of england eight percent 92 percent is off limits to us and that eight percent is including a bunch of uh, what are known as access islands and that is it's a patch of land it's a section of woodlands whatever that you have right to access you have the public right to be there you are allowed to be there irrespective of who owns it like you can be there and you can exist and you can just hang out and spend time there and it's you know it's exactly how it should be living in your own country but to get to that land there's no like there's no public access footpath to it or there's no like strip of public access land connected to a nearest road or whatever so you have to trespass through private land to get to the access land so the the eight percent is is actually way lower than even that and then if you're not able-bodied well that's it's a fraction of a fraction because so many of these trails are not maintained um so many styes are not maintained there's also some areas have limited what's the one for like they don't necessarily have to put size in if they can't be asked so like you can just get stuck behind like barbed wire fences and like livestock fences and stuff and you're really you're really fighting uphill battle with this stuff it's so crazy because you go across the border into scotland scotland has a right to roam you're allowed to access all of scotland like within limits there are restrictions to that there are obviously <laughs> because all of the sort of like anti right to roam stuff they're like oh my god you can have people, ramblers walking through your garden and so, like you're not like it's this is a a system that is designed so that you're walking through you know alexander darwell's garden because his garden is like 400 acres but it's, you're not gonna be walking you're not gonna have someone camping on your driveway you know what i mean like <laughs> you have to be x amount of distance from a road to be x amount of distance from private property um, the scottish one is um you can wild camp on any unfenced land so you can't camp in like fields and you can't camp in the middle of someone's livestock but open moorland commonland you know you can camp there and there's and you have to like you know leave no trace so you can't just go like who knew about the place and like there's restrictions on when, when and where you can have fires and so on and so forth so there's like there's a there's a myriad of restrictions that come along with it and there's also um a more educated countryside code about how to be in the countryside without damaging it without leaving traces without so on and so forth we just don't have that here and it's it's crazy that we've seen time and time again how important getting that in the countryside is for health i mean you look you go back in time like the victorians would like prescribe you countryside and like a rural retreat to just to get better if you were sick yes a lot of that was getting away from a smoggy like a highly polluted city full of like coal burning smokestacks and you know you, you miraculously get better from your consumption because you're breathing air that's not full of coal dust <laughs> but there's this emotional there's mental benefits as well we've seen that studies done during covid during all sorts of stuff we've seen how important it is to get away from people and to get out into greenery instead of gray cities and to get you know air through your lungs to get movement to get walking we've got an obesity crisis all around the world but in this country in particular like and the reason for that is people just don't have access to this sort of thing and people don't have it's it's not part of people's routines and it's not part of people's i don't know like enjoyment is is people don't have the opportunity to go out and do this sort of stuff so you end up stuck inside uh, in front of a screen particularly if you're working class let's be facing it like 
you know, I've talked a few times about how we growing up we didn't have a car so we couldn't get to anywhere and like the reason I became a gamer is because games are cheaper than buses you know what I mean like, I could get you could spend like four five six quid trying to get from Plymouth out to I don't know, Wembury for example like uh, out to a beach that's outside of the city limits or I can spend a quid in CEX and get a PS2 game. Or, you know, I can get, like, whatever. Like, so the reason everyone ends up behind a screen is because screens are cheaper. The way you get people away from that is you give people more access. And again, uh, with this 8% access thing, the lower your income, the further away from that you, you get. Like, it's um, the time it takes you to get from your, your front door to the countryside gets further and further and longer and longer. The, the more sort of working class you are so all of this stuff is it's both health and it's it's social classes and it's all of it sort of wrapped up into one into one issue now this the roach rock is uh it's known as a micro enclosure which is where uh it's purely a small section that has been gated off blocked you know whatever there's a second element to a lot of this and particularly with the Roach Rock, which is the excuse given, the justification for shutting it off is, oh, it's dangerous. Oh, it's dangerous. And, you know, they're not wrong. It's a 20 meter rock with a ruin on top of it. The ruin is very old. It may not be entirely stable at all times. And there's no guardrails on the ladders, no guardrails at the top. You know, you could theoretically fall the fuck off it and hurt yourself. But, that's you're right and, and the issue we have with this is we've through a sort of trickle down of America more than anything we've got this concept of litigation and like even if you are in the wrong and you hurt yourself you can still end up suing people fighting over who's to blame for you getting hurt it's slightly crazy really like we've had all sorts of high profile cases both here and America of like people being fucking idiots and then successfully suing. I mean, there was a McDonald's lady is probably the biggest one, right? You remember that? The lady scalded herself in her coffee and was able to successfully sue McDonald's because it was too hot. And I'm not being funny, but like, <laughs> you don't say, you know what I mean? That's one of those where like, you have to put like, make and say nuts on peanuts because like, <laughs> you, you have to tick the box or thing. And this is a wider issue just in society generally. I mean, I'm, I don't want to start using phrases like nutty state because I'm going to sound like a tosser, but I'm, I'm kind of going to. There's this sort of distrust of people to be able to think for themselves and having the opportunity to actually like be in, in control of their own agency, their own safety. And it's things like not giving you access to ruins and, and abandoned structures and big rocks and whatever but it's like it's even things like reducing the speed limits down and down and down and down because the way that or the, the, the way that government seems to think that you make people safer is to slow the cars down whereas actually the way you make people safer is to educate the pedestrians and to educate the drivers if we end up in this sort of scenario where no one can think for themselves because no one's ever had the chance to that's fine when they're in the soft and the nannying and the the comfortable protections with your low speed limits with your no access and your do not enters with your chevrons in front of every corner it's fine when you're there and the second you go somewhere that doesn't have that you immediately get hurt because you don't know how to how to operate like Little, little Jimmy who's grown up in a 20 zone has never had to judge car speeds before so he's fine when he's at home and then he goes to visit his mate who lives in a 30 or a 40 and gets immediately hit by a car and that's kind of the issue with this sort of rock access is common sense says should happen is there should just be a sign on the base of the rock that says yo rock might be dangerous it's tall it's old if you climb it and get hurt that's on you and that should be enough and then that's, that, that'll be fine and then people can decide on for themselves whether or not it's safe they can climb on their own uh, uh, safety and their own assumption and then they can just exist there and if they hurt themselves they hurt themselves they just 
pick themselves up and get on with it. Like, you know what I mean? Like, oops. I think I did that last time as well. Too busy yapping and not looking at my sat nav. Yeah, it's just, it's giving people the right, or giving people the ability to think for themselves through practice, through common sense. And again, like, you, uh, to bring it to roads, like, we have all these silly low speed limits everywhere, in cities, out of cities, even Dartmoor, even Dartmoor's got all its roads as 40. Bodminmore doesn't, Exmoor doesn't, you know, uh, like, Moreland up at the top of Cornwall doesn't. But Dartmoor does because it might be foggy occasionally, and because there are animals. Regardless of the fact, I mean, I've been, like I said, I'm from Plymouth, so I've been riding Dartmoor my whole riding life, basically, and it's absolutely fine. The animals don't run out in front of you, they don't run anywhere, even the newborn foals and sheep and stuff, they just don't. They walk out in front of you, and you can see them coming from literally miles, I mean, genuinely miles, because there's no hedges, and there's no, like, obstruction, so the majority of Dartmoor is fully open, like, you can see all the way down the valley kind of roads. So, I don't know, it's... It, it's... It, we get these, like, speed limits and these restrictions for our safety, but then you get someone that doesn't, and then you have a crash, because you you don't expect a corner, or because you haven't learnt to, to read a road ahead of you, or to, to drive slower in adverse conditions. You know, it's, it's the assumption that you put the speed limit at the slowest speed that is safe for the road in sort of the worst conditions possible when actually you should just put it at 60 and then let people slow down themselves based on not being a fucking dumbass and uh, whenever I look at like all the sort of chevron signs and the warning signs on corners I always think of like, like videos I've seen of people riding the Stelvio Pass there's no chevrons there there's no barriers there's no guardrails there's just a road with huge, huge death drops on the side. Like, properly huge death drops on the side. And it's just got, like, some little stone, like, battlements. And that's about it. And, then, and there's no signs. There's no, like, watch out, there's a corner, there's a switchback. It's just, like, dumbass. Drive up and down it and look. And you know what? There's very few accidents. And the accidents that do tend to be are, are all, like, awkward kind of fender benders on the switchbacks. But like no one's ploughing off the edge of the road because they didn't see a corner coming, for the most part. And it's the same with like you know the German autobahn. It's got a better safety rating than our motorways, even though it has no speed limit. And it's because people <laughs> expect it. People go on there and go, oh, it might be dangerous. There might be cars coming far, far faster than me. I'll drive with my eyes open, and then they'll be fine. And you know what? It is. And that's kind of the point. You know. My generation, I'm almost 30 by the way, so my generation and especially the generations after me, like you, you, what are they, Gen Z, Gen Z, I don't know, I lose track of which way they're in little life, but all of these like kids and like teenagers and into their 20s constantly getting shit off the old generations of like, oh you kids are so soft, you know, you never do anything. Yeah, oh, you, back in my day we didn't have all these soft play areas and we didn't have, you know, we just went out and split our heads open and laughed about it. <laughs> and, don't get me wrong, there's a balance to be, there's a balance to be struck between the two, where yes, you can make sensible protection for people, so people aren't just dying pointless deaths all the time, which happened a lot, like, even back in the day, like, people were getting killed by, you know, scaffolding and, like, the you know, shit falling them all the time. But at the same time, it's not the kids' fault that they've not that they've grown up in this world because they didn't build the world. The people complaining about it built the world. The boomers and the the people beyond them. They're the ones making the legislation. They're the ones in government and council and lawmakers and, and, and voters. Like this is the world they've built and then they're complaining about it. And it feels just unfair to these these people who are growing up without these sort of critical skills for one but without these freedoms as well. I think it's very telling that kids these days don't have those freedoms and that access to the world and then they're, they're getting so many issues both mental and physical as a result and they don't have the, the critical thinking the critical thinking and the 3D problem solving 
they don't have the fitness levels they don't have the sort of the creativity the imagination is being lost and i just i worry that it's uh, something has to change and this this sort of roach rock this is a perfect venn diagram of these two issues of both people particularly younger people growing up and not having access to their own country combined with growing up in cotton wool and not being able to not been able to, to, to form the the foundation of character that they need i think uh it's very important that we we push back against this and that we take these steps to ensure that these kids can grow up with an appreciation of the land with an appreciation of where they're from know where their food's from know what the countryside looks like you know know how to get dirty like it's all of these are skills and important skills that will then make them better adults and it's people like Lord Falmouth and Alexander Darwell and all of these people who are taking this away from generations of the public and it's up to us to to fight back really but anyway we're almost at the rock now I've been yapping for a while now I don't know how much of that I'll keep in but um I'm gonna head over now and then I'll catch up with you when we get there I'll try and take some photos and some some little videos and stuff for the people there so just to summarize this country is our country we live here we're born here we grow up here it's important people have access to it and connections to it they need to have without getting too pagan on you they need to have that connection and that shared energy with the land around them and you need to be able to you know dig your toes into the dirt and find out what it feels like it needs to not just be a plaything for the uber rich elite one percent it needs to be access for everyone it's every little micro enclosure yes it's a very small thing it's, don't get me wrong it's a very important piece of our history cornish history i say our obviously i don't claim to be cornish but our as the people it's a very important part of our history this uh this structure and it's something that's being taken away from us again by the upper class and every micro enclosure every footpath where you still have access but you've got barbed wire high fences on both sides hemming you in caging you in every one of these little erosions of access and freedom are the snowballs that become an avalanche of people never ever leaving their home and having no connection at all to the place that we live in the only way to prevent that is to push back against it so if you want to take part if you want to know more from people far more informed and eloquent than myself look up uh right to rome on instagram and other places uh look at right to rome carno for local areas here follow the news they have all sorts of really really intelligent people like it's proper good speakers just so yeah get informed get involved and don't let these freedoms be taken away without a fight you know and that goes for safety as well like don't let the childhood that we all hold dear and idolize in our heads don't let that be a thing of the past either like yes the world is a very different place than it was 40 years ago yes the population has doubled since our parents or you know our grandparents generation should we say 1974 was the last time the uh, earth's population was four million uh, four billion excuse me and obviously it's eight billion now so yes the world's a very different place yes there are dangers now that there were not in the past or less in the past but there's always balance and there's always ways to get around these things so that's all i've got to say on it yeah this is a very preachy vlog very preachy episode a very rambly one as always but hey rambling is part of right to road right <laughs> so get out there and uh, make a difference and that's all thank you all for watching next video will be less breachy i'm sure i hope and uh, i'll catch you all in the next one
I had a great afternoon at this meet, spending a few hours with the team from right to Rome Kerno, a few like-minded individuals who turned up, and even Folk to Graphic, who I met for the first time in person after talking online for ages. We chatted about the history of the area, the history of protests here, and the importance of having that access to our own heritage and land. I even picked up some litter on the walk over to the rock, leaving it better for our being there. I look forward to future meetups and projects with these folks and with the wider Right to Rome movement. Thanks for watching everyone, and if you want to get involved yourself, check the socials linked in the description below. Thanks all.